Yes. Okay, so welcome everybody to another one of SAPIX webinar series. Um, today, the topic, Supply Chain, the New Normal by Douglas Kent. It seems quite unfair to respond to the question, what's the new normal, when we hadn't quite tackled the old normal yet. Our discussion will focus on the elevated relevance of supply chain in managing risk and business continuity beyond the pandemic experience. It's not just the hype rush to newer, more innovative technologies, but also focus on getting the basics right. For most organizations today, we remain stuck in ineffective, ineffective use of antiquated processes and policies and insufficient use of existing technology. How do you know you are ready to weather the, the next storm? The session will test your maturity, challenge your organization's decision-making capabilities for resilience and carve a path to ensure future impacts of risk are minimized. So arrive with an open mind. So in short, Douglas has spent 30 plus years as a leading supply chain practitioner, advisor, and educator, and is currently the managing partner for Chainovation based in Coronado, CA. Douglas is a frequent lecturer and author of many supply chain articles and speaks frequently to audiences around the world, sharing his passion and decades of experience. So thank you for taking of your time to be with us, Douglas, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Did I hear you say 50 years? It sounded like you said 50 years, and then you went back and said decades of experience. So now you're making me feel a bit old. <laughs> so on that topic, I think we should all just wish Jenny a happy birthday a few days late. Happy birthday, Jenny. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's go ahead and, and get started. So we're actually going to use a little bit of... Uh, some interactive poll technology today. So I'm just gonna take a quick pause and ask that you access via your smart device or even you can do it on your laptop, et cetera, just so we can have some interactivity throughout our discussions today. So simply access it at pollev.com slash ASCM2. And then just type in your name. You only have to do this once. We have several questions we'll be going through throughout the context of the discussion. So I'll give you just a second. Make sure you get access to that. Again, pollev.com slash ASCM2. And the first question we're actually going to ask is actually around what country that you're dialing in from. So I think I know the answer probably for most of us. But let's go ahead and activate the survey simply. Once you've <laughs> accessed the survey through PolyV, you just simply place your marker on the country in which you're dialing in from. Maybe we have some others outside of just the southern end of the continent, it looks to be. Okay, it looks like, of course, the epicenter as we might expect here in South Africa. So just by way of introduction, again, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak with all of you today. Um, whoops, looks like the screen sharing stopped. Try to get back with that. It's not showing anymore, no. Let's try this again. It's not a very positive start. All right, so we'll get back into, uh, into the presentation itself here. Sorry for the technology disruption. In any case, we're just going to, uh, to introduce ourselves again um, in terms of uh, Chainovation. So Chainovation uh, is our company and we focus primarily on um, basically using the SCORE model to help transform our businesses. So a big part of mm. the work we do is of course the application of the SCORE model. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, in particular, I helped to do some of the education for SCORE professional training around the globe. 
um, and actually just use the uh, SCORE model as an application uh, to help companies transform their business. Of course, there's not a better time for transformation of the business than as is the case now. I don't want us to spend the time uh, too much focused on the doom and gloom of the current environment, but what we do know is that the coronavirus is, is not a temporary crisis. It's actually going to reshape how supply chain will need to work for the future. It certainly is and could be considered to be a, a, a permanent disruptor, uh, an unfortunate reminder of the agility of our supply chain. And we know this in terms of the just the number of times, if you watch any news program these days, the number of times that supply chain gets mentioned, how glorious for us in the industry. Now people actually know what it is that we do. Uh, if it wasn't resonant in terms of the conversations before, it certainly is now. Uh, things like toilet paper and everything else have been, of course, uh, news crises, uh, et cetera. But what it does definitely focus on is this concern around uh, agility. And so what I wanted to do is go back to another quiz question. And again, you'll be able to use exactly the same format as you had before. Um, and uh, just ask you this question in its current state, would you describe your organization as agile or fragile? Give a few seconds for this response. It's interesting. I wanted to see uh, how the organizations would answer this question today in light of the pandemic. Of course, we did, if you might recall, some of you would have been party to this discussion in an executive retreat last year, and I wanted to see how it compared. Uh, last year, we asked the same question, so we can actually do a comparison of the results from this year to last year to see how people feel uh, about their levels of agility or fragility. So let's just give another second or so to see these responses. It looks like uh, 56, we're landing around 56, so growing as we speak. So the majority, in fact, almost nearly 20% more feel as though today our business is more fragile than agile. If we do compare this to last year, then what we see is around the same. Yeah, it's not so different. Uh, so this is, this is actually good news for us, is that we still feel that in most cases we have some degree of agility, although of course we would certainly like to see uh, these numbers, of course, shift. So let's talk about that for just a moment. Of course, we know that the impacts, the economic impacts, particularly around South, South Africa, of course, has been quite dramatic. Um, not the least of which, of course, is the crisis occurring around the currency exchange, the RAND to US, US to RAND, for example, under, uh, under examination here. The good news is, particularly if we look at the last few weeks, um, it does seem to, the situation does seem to be improving. And it's demonstrated as we see the dips in these charts really hitting uh, several weeks ago, a month ago or so, where we really hit some of the rock bottom in terms of the currency exchange, and also is the case relative to the stock market. So a very huge dip, as we can see, sort of mid-March timeframe a slow climb back up, but actually when you take a look at the end results, and this was taken just this morning, in fact, uh, take a look at the end results of, of yesterday's market performance compared to where we were back at the end of December, it's actually quite a nice climb on the way back up. So, of course, in the mid-March timeframe, this is where we saw nearly one trillion rand was wiped off of the stock market at the time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what this means. And the reason that we say that this, uh, this impact, I don't want to say the pandemic itself, but the impact of the, the, the nature of the fragility of our supply chain is going to be some very large sector impacts. And this is just a minor list, right? Just as some of the more prevalent examples of how this pandemic has really changed the underlying operating model of businesses. And this is very important, of course, because supply chain is the, the, the massive contributor to the success of the operating model. 
So some sector impacts, for example, things like restaurants turning into retailers, uh, brick and mortar retailers are, are continuing to close. This has been particularly the case, for example, in the US, a number of brick and mortar retailers closing. Um, the, the, the outlook in terms of the commercial real estate market, in terms of more companies, of course, continuing to be home computing, working from home, with many large companies making public statements to say, this is not a trend that we, or this is not just the impact, this is going to be our future, making statements, for example, particularly for some of the larger tech companies, making statements, in fact, that Eclipse, even more than 50% of the staff will now be permanently working from home. Again, we think, see things like home workout, travel, uh, healthcare, of course, has reemerged as a major priority. Um, the impacts on gathering places such as restaurants and shopping malls, even university and colleges, um, we're just going to be really rethinking the underlying operating model that is a, a part of our new normal. Of course, that doesn't mean uh, that it's uh, difficult for everyone. Some have really, really managed uh, the crisis well and have, their businesses have absolutely exploded. Um, just the platform that we're working off of today, for example, on Zoom, um, 100, 131 million installs in the month of April alone, nearly a 60% increase from the same month just one year ago, 131 million installs. So some people, of course, just by the nature of the business, just by the nature of the products, the services that they are providing, um, have really thrived as a result of this. Of course, this isn't the case for everyone. That being said, with all of the uncertainty of the future, we're certainly not powerless. And I think that's why it takes us into the discussion about not only what is the new normal, but how do we prepare for that? How do we, how do we build the resiliency into the supply chain that's necessary for us to sustain our business for the future? And there's going to be a path for us to get there. I think that's clear. But what it means is that we first have to resolve the existing issues. We'll talk a little bit more about that. We're going to have to go through some degree of recovery. But what I want us to focus on is reimagining what the future is going to be. What is that path to reform that, that will be necessary for us to secure our supply chain resiliency? We can't skip the reimagine piece. And when Tanya did the introduction, I just want to reemphasize that my biggest fear is that people run immediately to new technology. And although a technology, new technology, innovative technology, certainly, and I will double stress, the opportunity associated with digital supply chain is massive for us, but it's not the end game. Some of the other fundamentals, in my mind, are even more crucial than just the technology that might be necessary to support them. So for the balance of our discussions today, what I'd really like to do is to talk about what that reimagined picture actually looks like. Let's start first with re-examining the path that we're going to need to go, to, to go through. So of course, we have this resolve phase. Um, we're going to have to address the immediate challenges that COVID-19 has on our workforce, on our customers, on our suppliers, right? That enterprise-wide supply chain, we're going to have to get through the resolution, the resolve associated with that immediate challenge. And then of course, we're going to have to scale a back to business plan pretty immediately. But it's gonna be slow. I anticipate the recovery for many companies is going to be certainly taking us throughout the balance of this year, and in many cases, into and through even 2021. However, in that recovery process, it gives us the opportunity to reimagine what our global supply chains will need to be to, requ to require us to get to that level of resiliency that's gonna be necessary for the new normal. 
And then of course, if as a part of that sustainability, we're gonna to have to remain agile to all the shifts that might happen to us from a regulatory and compliance standpoint. The rules, the regulations, how we can and cannot operate business, uh, everything from the, how we can transport from country to country, uh, the impacts that that could have in terms of maybe some opportunities, which I'll discuss later, and reshoring businesses, et cetera. So remaining agile to be able to understand how our supply chain operating models are going to have to shift in order to comply and meet what will be an ever-changing regulatory set of regulatory and compliance requirements. So let's talk about that reimagine uh, that reimagine journey. I'd like to talk about it in terms of what I think the reimagination of the global supply chains will absolutely require for the future. And I put this list together in an in a industry agnostic and industry neutral way, because I think these are absolutely the fundamentals that are going to be required in order for our global supply chains to survive. And and what I'd like to do is walk down this list of these five, uh, these five requirements with you in a little bit more detail, but let's review them from top to bottom. The first and perhaps the most important to my mind is a basic that we still fail to do in many instances. And that's to put a greater focus on our supply chain segmentation and the underlying operating model definition. We still have too many organizations that treat their supply chain as some kind of holistic entity not giving the distinctive operating model context that's necessary in order for those supply chain segments to compete more competitively compete in the markets so starting with that supply chain segmentation view deciding what our supply chains are and how those supply chains should be constructed from an operating model standpoint in order to meet the objective of specific supply chain attributes the second is around control tower technology. This has been around for a while, uh, and we're gonna talk about what's kept the path of difficulty of adoption in place, and it's no longer a nice to have technology. It's, it's, it's crucially important. We're gonna have to see the obstacles that sit in front of us if we have any chance to be able to measure and mitigate the risk. And that risk extends across the entire supply chain, plan, source, make, deliver, return, et cetera. Our control tower has to reach out into all of those processes, bringing that and harnessing that information together to enable the necessary decision making. I mentioned before, but of course the digital supply chain is gonna be important. It's not a must list of technology that we have to go off and immediately apply, but we have to make some conscious choices about how we integrate digital supply chain, contactless interfaces with our customer, the integration of industry 4.0 beyond what that we even thought would be possible. We'll take a look at some of the digital supply chain impacts that are necessary. If you're familiar, we'll also take a look at some of the new digital emerging practices that have appeared in the most recently released edition of the SCORE model. So you get a flavor for where we think those digital impacts are gonna lie in terms of some of the emerging practices. Network management has never been so important. Much like control tower technology, being able to construct and optimize network is crucially important. That being said, we typically have built a network strategy that balances between cost and customer service. Some attention to risk, but not as much as it needs to be. So our ability to construct and manage a supply chain network that does balance between the cost of the supply chain and the ability to service the customer, but also to protect, mitigate, minimize the exposure to risk. The last one is all around planning. It doesn't matter how well we can execute using all the above technologies, et cetera. It's gonna be great that we can execute, but if we can't layer our planning from strategic all the way down through operational and tactical, enable ourselves to be able to connect our strategy to our tactical execution, it's gonna be even more critically important. Integrated business planning, of course, is, 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 is a layer of advancement above PSYOP or SNOP that you might be more familiar with, right? We're going to have to be able to enable our planning to be incredibly agile, 
more agile than we've ever seen before. Constructing SNOP processes that work on a monthly cycle is probably not going to be the norm for the future. It's going to probably have to be something that's even more dynamic than that. So let's break these down again, taking a look at our first requirement and talk a little bit more about supply chain segmentation and the operating model definition. Um, and I wanna get pretty specific about both of those topics. Of course, this could be a subject on its own and if we desire, we of course could have a future webinar talking about these on, on their own, particularly around operating model definition. It does tend to be something that people get a little bit lost in terms of what that actually means. But let's start first with supply chain segmentation. What I said earlier, of course, is that companies, they try to think about supply chain in a more differentiated way. And we need to be able to do that. We can't treat our supply chain as a single holistic entity. The starting point of that, of course, is to ask some critical questions. Which markets and customers do we serve? Which products and services do they buy from us? What do they value from us? What we know that's 100% consistent and any analyst in the market of studying supply chain could absolutely confirm the fact that industry leaders do strive to be able to translate their business goals into strategies which are distinctive for each of the supply chains. We know that there are combinations within segmentation of products and services that we sell to markets and customers where we have to compete differently even for the same products and services, as we sell them into different customers or different through different channels or within different markets, our competitive differentiation could in fact be different even with the same products and services. And the inverse could be true also. The same customers who buy from us, depending on the products or services they buy, the way in which we drive that, that buy decision could absolutely be different. Again, here we have to keep, as we consider the operating models, that balance between the customer experience and that lower cost to serve. If you're familiar with the SCORE model, when I talk about competing different, competitive differentiation, competing requirements, we always return back to this collective set of five attributes. And it's important for us as we decide to go through the segmentation process is to take a look at each supply chain segment and on a cross-functional basis, take a decision about which of these attributes do we need to be superior at, right? Knowing that if we attempt to be superior across every attribute in the supply chain, it would be a disaster. In fact, it would be a recipe for bankruptcy. Each of the attributes drives are what our operating model has to deliver. Just as a reminder, we have the three customer facing attributes of reliability, responsiveness, and agility. Reliability, of course, measured by the metric of perfect order fulfillment says basically we did what we said we were going to do. Responsiveness is all about the speed of our supply chain and making sure that we get our products and our services to our customer at the shortest possible time, typically measured through the level one metric within the score as order fulfillment cycle time. Agility as well, and this is crucially important for us, and we put lesser emphasis on this attribute and the metric performance on this attribute than either of the above two. Agility, of course, is our ability to respond to market changes. Goodness, we've certainly had that experience. In most cases, if companies have put a focus on agility, they've focused on the upside, right? Op optimism, right? What do we do in terms of being able to construct a supply chain that can be agile in terms of upside, being able to quickly respond to external influences within the market, driving our demand level up. Now, of course, we've had the sobering experience of also having to focus on the downside. So our agility, another attribute of focus. We also have two internal focused attributes, of course, cost and assets. Cost are the overall cost of managing, operating our supply chain. Uh, level one metric for that, of course, is supply chain management costs, but also, of course, our cost of goods sold. On the asset side, this is a focus on all of our assets and our return on those assets. Using metrics like cash to cash cycle time, return on working capital, return on fixed assets, etc. 
what becomes important is how we choose which of those attributes are going to be the ones that are requiring us to create an operating model to support it. When we do supply chain segmentation, we ask that companies on a cross-functional basis choose these attributes, allowing for only one superior, two advantage, and two parity position, as you can see in this example. And this example is superior, of course, meaning you're the industry leader, mathematically the 90th percentile, this particular supply chain example would suggest that reliability would be our superior performance. We need to be the industry leader in perfect order fulfillment. However, we also want to maintain an advantage position on both responsiveness and cost. Advantage, of course, being better than most, parity, agility and asset, the equivalent of the mean. Making these choices helps to drive us down into then constructing an operating model that can be designed and operated to support those objectives. So let's talk about what an operating model actually is. <clears throat> so an operating model consists of lots of different factors. In the center, of course, we take a look at the overall value chain delivery, how we get that value proposition to that customer beneficiary. And that's where we see all the basic processes associated with the supply chain. This is where we see plan, source, make, deliver, return. Plan, of course, being that overarching control function that drives our execution. Execution, of course, occurring in source, make, deliver, and return. We'll return, of course, back to the discussion around plan as we discuss integrated business planning. What you see surrounding that value chain delivery, that excellent execution, that operational excellence that occurs in plan source, make, deliver, and return are a number of enablers. We'll talk a little bit further of these enablers, but in this construct, some, some key ones pop out. These are the ones that I think are the most important for us to focus on. And as SCORE defines the 11 enablers at SCORE, which we'll look at in a moment, what you'll see is that these are reflected in the diagram that I've assembled for your consideration today. So surrounding that value chain delivery up in the other left-hand side, we see supplier relationship management, crucially important. Uh, how we interface with our suppliers is incredibly important for our agility factors. We know this because our biggest barrier in agility, our biggest barrier in upside supply chain adaptability is our ability for our suppliers to keep pace. Where we have the opportunity to scale, we could capture future demand, but we lose the opportunity to create that revenue because our suppliers are holding us back. So our supplier relationship management and all things uh, source and supplier related, crucially important there. We already talked about the optimization of our overall supply chain network, of course, also crucially important, not only meeting those objectives of cost and service and risk, but also having a supply chain network that also is responsible to our environment. This is also critically important. Underlying those value chain delivery elements, of course, then we see things like organization, RIA, our responsibilities, our authorities, our structure, Sometimes our organization is our biggest barrier, right? It's too layered, it's too complicated. Um, the accountabilities are confusing. Um, I mean, just you know, talking about return to the basics, this is one thing that we, 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 we have got to resolve. Um, I think it will be interesting to see how this pandemic experience really helps us think about the delaying of our organization, thinking about spans of control, et cetera. Uh, one thing for certain, and I'd love to do another discussion specifically on this, is what does all of this mean from a workforce standpoint, right? Because there are going to be major shifts in terms of our workforce, major shifts in terms of the skills and competencies that we would need to reemphasize in order to build agility and resiliency into the supply chain. Our information and technology enablement, again, critically important. We're not going to make this successful, particularly as we migrate more into a digital world, uh, cobbling our supply chain together with a series of Excel spreadsheets. This isn't going to be possible. Um, things like control tower technology, of course, are desperately supported by the technology enablement. And then, of course, underlying all of this, what we see is governance and, and, and management. So again, one of the key basics how do, we manage our, how do we manage our supply chain performance? How do we manage our policies, our business rules, our regulatory and compliance factors, 
all of these things related to governance and to management. If you are familiar with this enabler list, what you see, of course, is that a lot of what I represented previously in the graphic are re-supported with these particular enablers. These enablers, again, falling all around the effectiveness, the efficiency, allowing our processes or supply chain processes to work effectively. Let's just do a quick run through these enablers so we have an understanding of what they are, right? E1, supply chain business rules. These are all things policy related, right? Business rules um, can also grow old, right? And we oftentimes see business rules that stick around way too long. So it's important that we establish the proper policies, just like a new product introduction. It's a new business rule introduction, new policy introduction, but we also have to remember to retire the old one. Supply chain performance, critically important, measuring our supply chain. The most important factor on this enabler, of course, is root cause and corrective action, right? For most companies, we're much better at root cause than we are corrective action, right? Root cause, of course, trying to cover, build rationale around why something happened, but we forget to put the corrective action into play. Data and information, think all things master data related. Again, the difference between data and information, data of course is, is what we need to turn it into information. Information is what enables decision making. So it is often the case that organizations are data rich, um, but information poor. Human resources, not only the amount of human resources that we have, but also the skills of those resources. Again, refocusing the effort on upskilling our teams, which of course is directly taking us into what is the learning and development programs that are necessary to meet the future state needs of our supply chain. But also, upskilling means the purposeful hire, right? It means that if we recognize skill gaps, we need to bring those skills into the organization. And that sometimes means we have to do some shifting around of our resources. So upskilling both learning and development, as well as, of course, the ability to manage the skills and competencies associated with the supply chain. And then we have, of course, the contracts piece. The contracts piece is also critically important for us because it is important that we manage all of our supply chain contracts. That means, of course, the contracts associated with our suppliers and our customers, uh, in, in addition to, of course, any other contracts that exist within our business. And then our overall supply chain network structure. Of course, this is also critically important for us, as we mentioned previously. It's important for us to understand how that network is constructed and that network is meeting the efficiency and the effectiveness goals of our organization. And then regulatory and compliance, again, critically important for us to meet the ever-changing needs of regulatory and compliance. We know that this continues to be a shift and we have to manage that very carefully. We have to make sure that our regulatory uh, requirements are being met consistently even as they, even as they change and they shift over, over time. And then finally, we take a look at the, the enablers, which are some of the, some of the newer enablers that have come onto play. And this is around supply chain procurement, supply chain technology. These are new enablers that have come into play for us just in the last, uh, the version 12 of, of the supply chain model. Um, so how do we effectively manage our procurement processes and overall our supply chain technology also critically important as we discussed as well. So let's take a look at here what these enablers mean. You try to do a quick uh, a quick poll on this one as well. So of these score enablers, which do you think are the most mature for your organization? So take a look. I'll pop back up the enabler screen there so you can see those enablers. And just type in the enabler, which you think that you're the most mature in. So again, going back to this list, just go back into your poll, ev.com ev.com slash ASCM2, and then just select your enabler, which you think is the most important from this list. And we'll take a view of those results.
give you a second to respond to that. See what the end result will be here. CE2 popping up high on the list so far. E8, see topping the list there as well. So it looks like E8, E2, E11, the primary ones, of course, E8 is the regulatory compliance piece. Of course, this is very industry uh, specific as well. Some of us are more regulated. Uh, E2, of course, around our management of our supply chain performance that we saw there. Uh, E11, around the technology. E10, around the supply chain procurement. Okay, good, uh, good view here. Okay, it looks like for the most part, supply chain performance, our ability, again, supply chain performance, that enabler to, um, do we have the right metrics? Are we, right, are we measuring the right things? Um, but also importantly is that root cause and corrective action. Again, reminding that a lot of uh, our, our activities are around the root cause and, and just some, and oftentimes also to a lesser degree around the corrective action portion of that. Let's move on to this control tower concept because I think this control tower concept is also crucially important for us as well as we take a look overall is how we gain visibility into the transactional activity that's happening within our, within our four walls but also across our entire enterprise. So from a control tower standpoint, it's very important that we can see those obstacles that sit in front of us, that we're, that we're heading in the right direction. The ability to see the obstacles is the most crucial part of this equation. If we don't have visibility into all of the key elements across our enterprise, across plan, across source, across make, across deliver, into our returns and enablements, if we are not able to visualize that transactional activity, those things which are happening within our supply chain, then we're gonna lose to some degree the ability to react to that visibility. So that's in fact what a control tower does for us. It allows us to gain that visibility. It allows us to be able to see that things are happening in the supply chain that we could take a proactive position on, that we're not just constantly mired in the firefighting, but actually we're equally focused on the fire prevention. So control tower, of course, is, is one of those things that we absolutely know uh, it's gonna be desperately important for us to be able to have that technology and that some of the enabling technology that's necessary is gonna be crucially important for us in this, in this equation. So if we think about the obstacles, which might be the most important for us, which of those obstacles do you think are most hidden? So if we took a look at all of these score level processes, the score level one processes, the processes of plan, source, make, deliver, return, enable, et cetera, which of those processes do you think where it exists the, the greatest degree of obstacles? Is that gonna be in plan? Is that gonna be in source? Is that gonna be make, deliver, return, the enablers? Um, let's take a look at your responses here. What we're seeing, of course, not a huge surprise to be honest, is that plan is already topping the list. Followed by source. So you've hit on uh, one of the, one of my favorite subjects, of course, again, we'll return back to the subject as we think about integrated business planning, but plan tends to be for all organizations in the last decade has continued to be the, of the six processes referenced here is the one where the majority of the, of, of, of the maturity concerns are, are present. So our ability to manage plan 
our, our maturity levels within plan tend to be lesser so than in fact in some, some other areas. So let's talk a little bit about the digital supply chain. So we also know that the digital supply chain arguably in the past is maybe for some been more hype than, than reality, uh, but the pursuit of a digital supply chain and digital capabilities, however they might be manifested, is probably more important now than it ever has been. And part of the evidence of that is the customers are becoming more comfortable in working in a new digital world. And that's not only business to consumer, but also business to business customers. So we're becoming much more, and I'll share with you some data coming out of a more recent study, where customers, because of the pandemic experience, have become much more comfortable working in a digital world. And this digital basically represents an easier path for us potentially to return to business. Some things we're going to have to be able to do digitally in order to reduce the amount of potential exposure that we have and things of that sort. And I think that that's going to represent the, the new reality. As I mentioned before, remote working is definitely not gonna go away. Targets have increased greater than 50%, as I mentioned for some companies in terms of the workforce will remain uh, will remain uh, indefinitely uh, being able to work on a remote basis. And contactless, as I mentioned before, of course, is, is in fact going to be the new norm. There are some examples here in terms of where digital plays in the cross plan source make delivery turn. It's just a minor list, of course, things like use of digital capabilities for data and analytics and replanning. Of course, as you saw before, a lot of obstacles exist there. Our ability to replan rapidly is crucially important. Being able to have digital platforms for communication across our, or across our supply base and our customer base is gonna be critical. On the supply base, being able to better interact with our, with our suppliers um, on, a, on a customer serving basis, having customers being able to self-serve, having things like drone deliveries, any of these things are also possibilities. So a, a massive list there. Again, we could spend a lot of time talking about the potential of digital capabilities. What becomes important here is they recognize that this pursuit of digital capabilities, again, like we talked about before in terms of control tower technology, this is no longer a nice to have. This, this is going to be a must have. And so we need to prepare for that journey now. As we also talked about just briefly, this issue with respect to uh, the customer journey, the customer is becoming uh, much more comfortable in working in, in, in a different, more digital environment. We need to think about how the supply chain uh, is going to support that, that complete rethink of, of, of the customer journey. Um, I, I, I read recently, and I love the comments, so I'll, I'll just repeat it here, is that our, our, our hierarchy of needs, if we reflect back on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, is now it needs to include a digital supply chain and a complete rethink of our customer journey. Digital supply chain is going to be uh, almost you know, completely necessary, regardless of the business you're in, it's going to be completely necessary for us. Again, I refer back to SCORE, which is the source of a lot of new digital capabilities in terms of the emerging practices. So in the new SCORE model, if you're not familiar with the most recent release of the SCORE digital standards, which replaced the uh, previous version 12 of SCORE, one of the major content changes in the new digital release is the addition of a lot of emerging practices that are focused on digital capabilities. So if you want to take a look at those emerging practices, and this is just a quick sample list of what those look like here, but those new emerging practices, in fact, there were 19 new emerging practices that were added as a result of the inclusion of some of the digital capabilities into this new version um, of the SCORE model. Another one of our critical requirements for resiliency, as we discussed, of course, is our supply chain network management. So being able to manage a supply chain also for control of risk, not just uh, in terms of balancing that, that cost in the customer service element of that. It was a real wake up call. 
Um, I loved this particular article. Some of you may know Bindya. She's uh, she's the CEO of a company called uh, Resilink. Um, Bindya um, and and two others, Thomas and Dale, wrote this great article in the Harvard Business Review, talking about the wake up call for supply chain management. And the focus of this was really around the supply chain network planning. I encourage you to take a look at the article, but. Uh, one of the reasons that they said we were unprepared for the coronavirus impact from a supply chain perspective is because the required resources for supply chain network mapping are too expensive. So in essence, if you think about it, being able to map out our supply chain, being able to look at the potential risks that exist in our multi-tiered supply chain is critically important for us. So we need to make sure that as we climb up this uh, capability to be able to do more progressive, uh, quicker supply chain scenario mapping to take a look at different impacts, that of course we make that accessible to companies by being able to lower the cost to do this type of activity. The other thing as it relates to supply chain network that I'm 100% convinced about, so bring, bring us back together in a year and let's see if I'm right. Um, reshoring will be on the rise. Um, there's just too many risks associated with some of the global reach of our supply chain today. Um, it was interesting, as you see here on the left, went back and took a look at the crisis situation, similar to the one that we're undergoing now, of course, the most, uh, the most easiest to do a comparative on is the SARS crisis back in 2003. 2003, during the SARS crisis, China was 2% of the global GDP. At the current time during the COVID crisis, it was 20% of the global GDP. And 90% of the global 1,000 had tier one and or tier two suppliers in COVID-19 affected regions just in China. So if those statistics don't scare you, uh, what one thing we'll know is that there is absolutely going to be a move towards more reshoring. And this has some other implications as you can see on the upper right hand side here, um, just in terms of what that means. And these are positive and negative Im implications. Um, you know, on the negative side, our, our, our chase for upskilling is going to be even more difficult than ever before. Um, in many cases, some of the skills that had been previously outsourced and now will get reshored, we probably are not prepared for that. Um, but as a lack of that preparation, as a lack of the available talent, of course, in some instances, the positive corollary to that condition could be, of course, the fact that we might end up with higher wages. So there are going to be both positive and negative impacts associated with the strive to reshore some activities. But again, this is not a question of if, this is a question of when. The last of our critical capability topics around integrated business planning. So as I mentioned before, integrated business planning, kind of like PSYOP or, or SNOP on steroids. This is something we're absolutely going to have to be able to focus on. We're gonna need to be able to pull all of our planning pieces together we're going to need to use our planning to, to, to allow us to, to meet some of our increased objectives in terms of adaptability and agility. As I mentioned before, that critical attribute of agility is typically measured by two metrics, upside supply chain adaptability and downside supply chain adaptability. It's going to be crucially important that we design a planning process that integrates our supply chain planning with our sales, forecasting, budgeting processes, with our strategic and commercial planning, all of those things are aligned together in order for us to rapidly be able to, to shift course. We're gonna have to pivot our supply chain faster and more than ever before. We can't do that through execution excellence. We have to have a better planning capability to make that a reality. In addition to that, the metamorphosis of demand, this is actually some work done by, uh, by McKinsey. Pretty interesting to take a look at some of the things that are happening at the consumer level in terms of behavior. I already mentioned that more consumers are comfortable with going digital, and in fact, this is absolutely proven to be the case. More consumers are shopping online. That's why you see the rise of 
companies like Amazon and others, the retailers who have shifted to digital platforms much better than others, but also at the consumer level are switching has accelerated. Switching from not being loyal to new brands, uh, switching to new websites, switching to new uh, grocery stores, switching to our, our switching has been accelerated more than ever before. It's a little bit concerning because we can't necessarily always depend on brand lo loyalty. I've been saying this for years is that as a consumer, we're becoming uh, much more demanding. So if product is not available, then we'll switch. Now, of course, we always remain loyal to certain brands, but our switching is accelerating, and this is absolutely the case. Now, what I want you to think about relative to the switching costs, of course, as we think about this metamorphosis of demand, is what's that going to mean from an inventory standpoint? Most analysts are saying that the inventory necessary to support our new normal supply chain is going to be considerably more than that which it is today. And this demand pattern of switching, acceleration of switching, is one of the drivers for that. If we don't have the product, customers are willing to switch and not wait for us to have inventory, this is gonna have a crucial potential impact. So in summary, really we need to rethink our global supply chain overall. I do think that these five factors, and certainly there are others, I'm not saying these are the only five factors, but what I would certainly say is that supply chain segmentation and the operating model definition, this is a crucially important fundamental. If we don't segment our supply chains and we don't purposely design and operate these operating models to support the unique needs of those supply chains, not the least of which is supporting those superior and advantage attribute choices, we're gonna miss. If we can't see into the supply chain to see those obstacles, we can't identify risks before they occur. We can't start the fire prevention because we're mired into the firefighting. We, we're going to have to get better at control tower technology. We need to see into our supply chain what is happening and get ahead of the risk. The digital supply chain is gonna be a must. It's gonna be now. Um, not every element of that, not every element of digital supply chain is gonna be important. Additive manufacturing, artificial intelligence, robotics, each of those potential digital supply chain and new technology capabilities are gonna have different value propositions for different companies. Don't rush just to get digital, say you're digital, but make the, make the acquisitions of the technologies to support digital supply chain where it's gonna meet your higher level objectives. On the supply chain network management, again, we're gonna be very much driven by the risk mitigation, probably even more so than cost optimization, being able to ensure that our risks are limited, even if it means in some instances a greater cost. We have to layer our planning capabilities from strategy to tactical execution. At a minimum, we have to be excellent at running a consistent and mature sales and operations planning process and making sure the other planning elements within our business are fully integrated as well. I'd like to just close and hopefully we'll have time for a couple of quick comments here, a couple of reference tools for you. Um, we do have, of course, the new digital standard that exists. We have the SCORE-P training that's being now delivered virtually. If you're interested in that, you can see that as well. You can check that out on our website. We do have future state sessions, come, future sessions coming up for virtual delivery on the training, uh, both for July and for November, if you're interested. And the other thing I would say is also take a look at the new ASCM Enterprise certifications. Um, this allows you the ability to do your own resiliency health check. It really takes a look organizationally across your enterprise how well you're meeting standards that hit all three of these pillars, economic, ecological, and ethical. Um, registration fees for all ASM corporate members is now waived. There's also a free maturity assessment that exists. Um, and these standards are freely available and completely transparent, and you can download those on the ASM.org website. If I can help in any other way, feel free to give us a call or contact us, info at chainovation.com for any of these aspects as well. And of course, um, if you would like a copy of this presentation, any of the materials here ready 
uh, ready to send you a copy of that uh, if you desire. All right, so that's uh, really the information that I wanted to share today. So I'll turn it back over to the SAPIX team to see if there are any questions that we have just a few minutes of time to be able to answer for you. Thank you, Douglas. That was um, very insightful. I think that um, there are a lot of businesses that have lots and lots of work to do and lots to consider. Um, our chat line is very quiet and I'm, I'm wondering why that is. Um, there have to be some questions. Hopefully so. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm maybe that, yes. Uh, Quivers again, um, if you don't mind, I will try to avoid the chat room um, and just make this comment. I read an article this morning that the severe negative impact of COVID-19 specifically on the South African market is far more extreme than what anyone anticipated. Um, and the specific comment I want to make is the fact that they claim this is a, a prediction that, and they mentioned a few, there's quite a few companies that's older than 100 years in South Africa. That has always been, they, they've always been around as one of the prime business um, businesses, and they're just going to fold. Mm -hmm. So listening to what um, the presentation indicates, there's a lot of companies that were not prepared for this at all, not even closely. Yeah, and I, if I could just comment on Kobus, I think it's a great observation. Um, and I think it's not endemic just to South Africa, but of course you do have a number of, in particular industries, you have a number of companies that have that you know century long uh, experience. Of course, we know those are some of the ones that also, just the luxury of perhaps of being one of a few entities, they've perhaps not been as innovative as they as they could or should be. Uh, and we're seeing the same across the world, organizations that are folding uh, that, that do have a long history and probably because they haven't made this forward looking investment, got a little too comfortable perhaps in being an industry leader by the nature of their history. Uh, and, and that of course can, can contribute to the to the the lack of maturity and moving forward here hopefully some of those hopefully it will be a wake-up call for some of these companies and they don't dissipate because the impact Definitely. of the workforce and the economy is, is is crucial and we certainly don't want to see that for south africa so yeah, thank thanks. you for thank your you, comments Douglas. great no. yeah no i i think to that point um that that was already happening here before COVID hit so so um I think it's Jenny that's pointed out complacency killed the cat. We, we've, ha we've had a lot of that um, even before COVID-19. We were on a slippery slope. And I think traditionally as South Africans, uh, we are reluctant to change. We are not risk takers. Um, it's kind of like, let's just hold back and see how much longer we can hold out for. But I don't think that we can do that anymore. Um, we attended a session about two weeks ago, a webinar, where the presenter was talking about, um, well, when when is the right time to make change? Well, you're in the middle of absolute chaos now. Why just not throw now. a little bit more into the pot and just get it done? Um, so, so I think that a lot of food for thought and and complacency will kill you. And if 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 everybody thought it was rough before COVID nineteen, well you know, we're in for an even more bumpy ride. So lots to think about, lots to consider. And I think lots of organizations, um, not just in South Africa, but, but globally, have got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. And I think a lot of them have been caught short with the, with the risk strategies. Um, I mean, sure, um, a pandemic is one thing, but, but it's kind of one of those things that they compile and it gets put in a, in a file somewhere and stored and, um, you know, we'll update it, we'll get to it. And, and yeah, doesn't happen. So um, any more questions, any more comments before we, we wrap up here? Uh, Tonya, Ken here. Go for it, Ken. Yeah, look, I've been involved with the uh, score. I think I was the first person in, in Africa to get the score P. And I'm just very disappointed that Apex doesn't make it very easy for companies to get involved with SCORE. It's so expensive. 
expensive here in, and yet it's such fantastic stuff. We should be giving it away for free so that everybody in the supply chain takes advantage of this. Um, and it's just, how many people in South Africa really get involved in SCORE? I, I don't know, can you count them on that fingers of one hand? I don't know, Jenny, can you, can you help us out on that? Yeah, I, I would say that there's a lot of people who have been involved with it informally. I think formally from a training and an implementation point of view, you're absolutely right. It has been quite inaccessible because of the expense, but there is a whole new dynamic behind it and it is being driven very hard by Mr. Kent and his team here in South Africa. So I would watch this space, watch SAPEX's okay. announcements and notifications and things, because I know that Douglas has a particular um, excitement, well, just, just drive to make it more accessible to everybody. So am I right there, Doug? You are 100% correct, yeah. I say watch okay. this space. Some things are definitely moving. So just a good example of this is the the ASM Enterprise, this previously had a fee basis of 75 grand, and now the fees have been waived for if you're for corporate. Uh, so for now, at least corporate members. So, um, but but already these are, the, you're starting to see the moves forward to say, uh, we need to do more to proliferate the community with, uh, with the expertise that has been harnessed in the SCORE model and the enterprise certification models and the new digital capability models. I couldn't agree more, Ken. Uh, so we continue to work hard to make sure that the accessibility of that information, even the training, is becoming, uh, let's say, more global. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, We're very glad to hear that. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know. Terrific. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Ken. What was Fidel, Fidel saying? Could it be sum up to adapting and at the same time holding on to timeless and unchangeable truths or concepts in supply chain, like the concept of flow and revenue? Well, I don't think we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, that's for sure, as they say, right? So um, I think what becomes critical here is, again, going back to making decisions about how you want to compete within the market and making sure that the fundamentals and the, and the, and the I'd like to say it like this, is we need to understand how we compete on the complexity, right? Uh, let's not dumb down our supply chains to standardize everything and try to move to too big of a global model uh, to try to make everything operate in the same way. But we need to understand what those differences are and we need to get the best at competing on that complexity. And I think that's, uh, that's the key here. So if there are no more questions, so we will make this recording available. Um, and, and Douglas, you are happy for us to share the presentation as well. Um, Absolutely. And if there are any questions or anybody wants any assistance or advice, um, we will gladly include um, Doug and um, the Grant. name is gone. Grant, Grant, Grant's details so that you can, you know, drop in a note, reach out. Um, ask for help, but um, thank you, Douglas, for your presentation. Thank you for being here with us. It was a re reasonably early start for you, um, but we thank you for your time. We thank you for a superb presentation, lots of food for thought, um, and for, for giving of your time to us in South Africa. Jenny. <laughs> I just want to say Niraj just asked a question um, and yeah. loads of comments, Doug, about um, it being a great presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, but Niraj is asking, are there any good news stories to share? Examples of companies who have been agile enough to thrive in the face of COVID? I know it's early days and I guess Zoom is one of those classic examples. Um, but uh, there's, but there's a number of them. There? Yeah. Yeah. There's a number of them. Um, Zoom, Peloton is another one, right? Uh, they run, they, they build the advanced uh, bicycling capabilities that you can ride with other people online, et cetera. Um, it's a great question. And there are, there are these pockets of success. I think what's interesting is what made them successful. So uh, what I would say to that is uh, let's come back together and we'll, I'll, I'll be happy to come back and share some of the success stories with, the, with our SAFEX team here. You're on. That would be fantastic. That can be fantastic. We look forward to that. So Great. thank you all for joining us. Thank you for giving of your time. I hope that this was interesting and worthwhile. 
and uh, we're going to hold you to that, Doug. We're going to bring you back in for some success stories there. I've also made some notes on other webinars, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, here, I'm here for you. I know, and we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Douglas. You. Thanks, everyone. Have a okay. great day. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank Good you. night. Yeah, Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. bye. Many thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye, James.